Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started this morning by just welcoming everyone. Sawadee Kaab. Sawadee Kaab, welcome to everyone here and welcome to everyone online as well. Today is our Pali Canon in English study group and we study the original words of the Buddha in order to help students move their mind closer and closer to the enlightened mental state. What enlightenment is, is where your mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. It no longer experiences any anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress stress, anxiety, loneliness, boredom, shyness, resentment, jealousy, all these discontent feelings and others are eliminated from the mind. And meditation is an important training that we do in order to help you get to enlightenment. And you would need to develop your own meditation practice. But when students come to class like this, we usually start with meditation. So if you'd like to join for meditation, I'm going to start with some chanting to help ease us into meditation. And I see some of you guys have the chanting sheets. Those chants are in the Pali language. This is the original language of the teachings of the Buddha. We have the sheets over here. It uh, looks like he's going to hand them out for you guys. Um, if you read the English translations, you'll be able to see that there's a lot of respect and gratitude and admiration for the Buddha in these chants. The Buddha didn't actually create these chants himself. I suspect that his students created them either during his life or after his death as a way to honor and respect him for his time and effort and energy to share the teachings that he did. Because if you had a teacher who helped you go from anger and sadness to peace and joy, and they didn't want anything from you, they didn't expect anything from you, you'd probably have a lot of respect and gratitude for that person too. So I suspect his students created these because a Buddha is not going to walk around and teach people to chant to him uh, out of admiration and respect. That would be the ego if somebody did that. So I suspect that they created these either during his life or after his death. And I still chant them as a way to also have admiration and respect for the Buddha, but really to ease the mind into meditation and get more benefit out of the meditation itself. These chants, they're not a rite, a ritual, or a ceremony, or worship. It's not prayer or anything like that. It really just helps to build awareness of the mind and awareness of the breath. And it eases the mind into meditation so you can get more benefit out of the meditation itself. So I'll start with the chanting and easing us into meditation. You guys are welcome to join along. Then afterwards, I'll come in with some guidance to help guide you in your meditation practice. And then there'll be a period of time where it'll just be quiet. We'll just all be meditating together. Everyone here and everyone online, we just all meditate together. And then we'll come out of the meditation with some more chanting as well. In terms of sitting uh, for your meditation or body position for meditation, usually people learn in the seated position. This is very common, but there are other positions too. There's lying, standing, walking, and seated meditation. But seated meditation is where people usually will begin and where they start. You can either be sitting on the floor in a chair or really anywhere you like. It's important that your body's comfortable. I'll give you some guidance on body positioning, but remember, it's really up to you to find what's comfortable. If you're on the floor, it's not nice to usually to have a cushion under your rear, even more than one maybe. Uh, some people like to put their legs off the mat. This gets the hips up in the air to lessen the angle at the hips, the knees, and the ankles. If you have your legs just lightly crossed, you'll find that this works out better because then it won't inhibit the circulation. If you're in a chair, sometimes people like to put their feet flat on the floor or cross at the ankles. This will help you uh, as well just to be relaxed. But like I mentioned, it's really up to you. It's however you would like to sit. It's not about everyone doing it exactly the same way. The hands and the arms, the Buddha put his right hand over his left with his thumbs together and he put this into his lap. So if this is comfortable for you, you could use this. But again, there's other options because it's not about everyone doing it exactly the same way. Some people like to put their palms on their thighs or on their knees or their palms up. Some people like to rest their hands in their lap. So whatever's comfortable for you, you can just find that with the hands and the arms. The upper body is best if it's erect. By having the upper body erect, this keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation. Whereas if you were slouched, the mind would have a tendency to be dull or lethargic. But if you were real rigid, the mind could be overactive or uptight. So you like the upper body to be erect with your sternum up and your shoulders back. This keeps the mind attentive and alert. And it also helps you to breathe in through the nose and out through the nose during your meditation. So again, we'll ease into meditation with some chanting. And then I'll come back in with some guidance to help you guys understand how to meditate. Ara 
Close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Here you're just looking to establish the breath, a nice, natural, steady, consistent breath, not forced or controlled. Just a gradual inhale through the nose, experiencing the full breath. And then, whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Breathing in. in out breathing in and out Your breath may not match up with the guidance that I'm providing, and that's okay. This is your practice. I'm just here for guidance. You can use this voice as a reminder that whenever you get to the next inhale, breathing gradually through the nose, developing a nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. And then, whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose, experiencing the full breath. 
Breathing in. And out. Breathing in. And out. Once the breath is well established, start fixating the mind on the breath. Either the sound of the breath coming into the nose, or the sensation of air moving over the skin into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. And out. Breathing in and out. With the mind fixated on the breath, whenever you notice that it moves off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath the present moment. No need to observe the thought, label it, judge it, analyze it, or even try to figure out where it's coming from. Whenever you notice that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work of focusing on the breath, cutting off and letting go any time the mind moves off the breath. You have nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath, breathing in and out,
I'd like to once again welcome all of you guys here at the temple and those of you guys that are online joining us. Welcome to everyone. Welcome to Watung Yu. For those of you guys that are here at the temple and this is your first time, I'd like to let you know that in the back of the room, the very last door, there's a bathroom. You're welcome to use it at any time. If you need a larger bathroom, because there's just one there, if you need more, you just go outside the classroom and there are signs that'll take you around to the main temple bathroom. So you're welcome to use those at any time that you need. We even have water and some snacks over here from our students that are providing these kinds of things. So you're welcome to even help yourself to water and snacks if you'd like. Make yourself comfortable. As I was mentioning at the beginning, this is the Pali Canon in English study group uh, where we study the original words of the Buddha. It's more of a study group versus a traditional style of learning. When I teach on Sundays and Wednesdays and various courses and classes and retreats, it's more of a traditional style of learning where I'm teaching you for a period of time, maybe 15, 20, 30 minutes, and then I'm opening up for any questions that you guys have. Then I teach some more for another 15, 20, 30 minutes and open up for questions. But in this particular program, what I do is I have these discourses of the Buddha. These are the original words of the Buddha where I ask for a volunteer here at the temple or those of you guys on in Zoom. If you would like to read this particular chapter, you can read the chapter out loud uh, and then those of us uh, will hear you reading and will be able to benefit from uh, studying these words together. And then after somebody reads the chapter, then what I do is I will share a little bit of teachings on this, and then I will open up to any and all questions that you have. As you see, some of these are very short. This one's only one sentence, actually. Uh, so 
uh, what I'll do is just turn it over to you guys to see if there's someone who's interested in volunteering to read this. If you're here at the temple and you'd like to read this, we have microphones in the white bowl here. That way we'll be able to hear you here at the temple and the people online will be able to hear you as well. And the way that you use these is there's a little gray button. You just press it and the lights come on. You just wait a second or so and then you hold it up to your chin. And then like I mentioned, we'll be able to hear you here at the temple and they'll be able to hear you online. And for those of you guys in Zoom, if you just electronically raise your hand, I'll be able to see that and then you can open up your microphone and you'll be able to read and we'll be able to hear you here at the temple. So is there someone here that would like to read this particular chapter, this sentence? I think you're thinking about it. Yep. Go ahead. The perfectly enlightened one prohibits monks from boasting about a non-existence of state of further men in oneself. Whatever monk should speak of a condition of further men, attainment of jhanas or stage of enlightenment to one who is not ordained, if it is a fact there is, if it is a fact there is an offense of wrongdoing. Okay, thank you, sir. So what the Buddha is teaching here is that if you're discussing your attainments, which are called the jhanas or the stages of enlightenment, that if you're sharing this openly and kind of declaring this to somebody, that this is very unwise. What the Buddhist teachings are, are, are doing is they're helping you to awaken to enlightenment. You're moving your mind to a higher consciousness where your mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy permanently. You've eradicated pollutions of the mind that he discovered using the tools and techniques that he taught. The teachings of the Buddha aren't a bunch of beliefs that you believe and then you hope something good happens when you die. His teachings aren't rules. They're not commandments either. Instead, he's teaching you about the natural world around you and you can learn those teachings you can independently verify them by reflecting on them and you can practice them and see the truth for yourself as you train your mind it's becoming more and more peaceful and joyful all the way to the point where you don't even experience a bad mood anymore by the time you get to enlightenment you're always in a good mood so here the Buddha is talking about these uh, you know kind of declaring to other people that you are in a certain jhana which is a preliminary phase that your mind moves through on your way to enlightenment or that if you're claiming that you're in one of the particular stages of enlightenment this would be very unwise and he's suggesting for people not to do that the reason why is because part of getting to enlightenment is to eliminate your boastfulness your conceit your ego your you know looking down on other people thinking that you're so great and other people aren't right instead what the buddha taught and what you need to do in order to get to enlightenment is to view everybody equally that you are just one person of many on this planet there's over eight billion people on the planet and you're just one of those people you're not special you're not somebody who needs to put themselves on top of others and look down on others instead when you look at yourself as equal as being equal then you can relate to all beings harmoniously but as long as you put yourself above people and you look down on people, people will reject you because that's the ego, that arrogance, that boastfulness. And you don't need that here in the human world. The people will just push you aside. But also putting yourself below people is just as dangerous to your mind as putting yourself above people. Because if you put yourself below people, you're going to diminish yourself. You're going to have negative self-talk in the mind. And this isn't going to help you in life. So what the Buddha teaches is that we should be humble Instead of going around boasting that our mind is concentrated or clear or that we're so peaceful or so joyful or that we've, um, you know, attained any particular stage of enlightenment or one of these jhanas, instead just remain humble. You might end up talking to your teacher at different times about where you think you are on the journey to enlightenment because it, it's helpful for you to have that private discussion with the teacher that says, hey, I think I'm in the first jhana or the second or the third or the fourth. Can you help me figure this out? Because these are ways that you can plot your steps forward in your personal growth. Or you might 
talk to your teacher saying that you think you're in the first stage or the second or the third or the fourth stage of enlightenment. And then the teacher can actually help you to figure that out. And then you'll know how to grow from that point forward. So these attainments of the jhanas and these four stages of enlightenment, it's not like a badge that you walk around and you talk about and you boast about. It's not something you put on your Facebook page. You know, you don't call your mom and like, hey mom, guess what? I'm a stream enter. I got to the first stage of enlightenment. Can you believe that? That's so amazing. Aren't you proud of me? Right? This is looking for admiration from other people, right? This is a desire. So what you're trying to do is not only eliminate your ego or your conceit, but you're also looking to eliminate this longing and yearning, this craving, this desire, wanting uh, admiration and respect from other people. Where this comes from in the human mind is it comes from our animal existences. When we were in animal existences before this, and there's been countless existences that you've experienced before this human existence, we needed conceit in the animal world. We needed in our wolf pack, we needed to know who's the male and female, who are the alphas, so that they can teach us how to hunt and they can teach us how to survive. If we didn't know who the alpha male and alpha female were, we wouldn't be able to learn how to survive and how to hunt as wolves. If we didn't know who the matriarch of our elephant herd was, We wouldn't know where the migration paths are. We wouldn't know where the watering holes are. We wouldn't know where to eat and things like this. So we needed conceit. We needed a pecking order in the animal realm. But here in the human realm, the mind has been conditioned so much through these animal existences that coming into the human realm, the mind retains this type of consciousness and the mind's looking for this pecking order of where you are in this particular pecking order. But instead, you can eliminate that conceit and you can just think of yourself as being equal because we don't need a pecking order in the human world where other people might think that way. They might think that they're above you or below you. That's them. But your mind doesn't need to do that. So if you were to meet a famous celebrity or if you were to meet the president or prime minister of your country, it would be wise for you to treat that person the exact same way that you treat a waiter or a taxi driver or a street sweeper or somebody like that. Because in order to get to this permanent peacefulness and joy that is the enlightened mind, you're going to need to develop a life practice that is permanent, where you can just treat everybody equally. Whereas if you treat some people this way and you treat some people this way, your mind's going to have to constantly figure out where is this person in this pecking order? Because I need to treat them this way and I need to treat these people over here this way, this different way. And then if you're ever in mixed company, your mind's going to have to constantly be switching and figuring out how to treat one person versus another. But if you can develop a life practice where you're just treating everybody equally, it doesn't matter their position in society or their role in society or what they're doing. You can just treat everybody equally, treat everyone the same. Your mind can be at ease. It's so easy to just treat everybody polite, kind, friendly, and respectful, and for you to be humble. So here the Buddha is just giving this one little teaching here about how it's unwise to talk about your attainments of the jhanas or any of the stages of enlightenment with other people because this isn't actually helping you. It's actually hurting you because there's boastfulness and arrogance and this conceit in there. And there could be this admiration for, uh, you know, or this desire for admiration from others. And you may need to talk about these things with your teacher, but that's about the only person you would ever really talk to them about. You wouldn't need to talk to them with anybody else because it's your own personal journey to enlightenment. It's not about other people. It's not about judging where you are in the world versus somebody else, you're in your own personal journey. So if you need to talk about these kinds of things with your teacher to be able to help you to progress, then that's something you may need to do. But with other people, there's just no reason and it's actually hurting you because it's allowing the conceit to continue to exist in the mind. So do you guys have any questions on this particular teaching here? This one uh, teaching, by the way, this is volume 12, chapter 11. And those of you guys that are here at the temple, you can just ask questions with the microphones here. For those of you guys online, you can put your questions into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Are there any questions here? Yes, sir. As a lay meditator, um, one who's not ordained, um, often either, I guess here or other retreats um, in meditation, there's often groups of lays discussing their meditation together. So it just, I guess I'm just stuck, the one question is just on the ordained part. 
because often we're having discussions as a group, maybe of lay meditators who are not ordained and discussing um, maybe lesser uh, experiences in meditation and, and, and that in itself, and as well maybe outside of retreat or among friends who are also meditating. So for, for myself, I'd always taken up a view of discussing meditation only with people who meditate, but again, this is talking about being ordained which is a harder precept uh, or harder, I guess, level grade, if you get what, I, what I'm getting at. Yeah, Yeah. there's a few things here for you to help clarify this, is what the Buddha is doing here in this particular book that I've assembled all these different teachings is most of these teachings are for the ordained practitioners, this volume 12, it's titled Lowly Arts, and this is where the Buddha is talking to ordained practitioners about things that are unwise for them to be doing and there's various reasons why he's teaching that but then there's also teachings here for household practitioners too the teaching prior to this that you had didn't see because it's chapter 10 we did it last week is where uh, the buddha is talking to household practitioners all the students and saying it's unwise to share your attainments so here what the buddha is saying is for ordained practitioners they talk amongst themselves about their attainments because they're supporting each other in their journey to enlightenment. As a household practitioner, which is what I taught, which is what what the Buddha also taught in this previous chapter back here. I'll show you this one here, where he's not addressing the ordained practitioner specifically, he's addressing all students. So he's describing that it's unwise to talk about your attainments. Talking about meditation is different, right? Like if you sat down with another student and you guys were like, hey, you know, how is it for you sitting in meditation? You know, what do you experience? And they're like, oh, my mind's kind of busy. It's kind of rattled, you know, kind of shaken up. And it's like, oh, okay, I understand. So you can seek information from people, but you shouldn't do it as a way for you to share and just look how great I am. Yeah, my meditation is so peaceful and I didn't experience any of that stuff. That's not the purpose of asking someone about their practice or discussing about their practice, it would be for you to gain insight and wisdom to be able to help you and support you in your practice. Where sometimes what you'll see in certain environments that they don't understand where ego is a huge problem and a huge impediment to enlightenment is you'll see a bunch of egotistical sharing where people are trying to one up each other and look how great I am for, yeah, I meditate, you know, two hours a, a, a session, uh, three days a week uh, or three, three times a day or whatever or yeah when I'm meditating I experience this and I experience that and it's just sharing as a way to boast about what they're experiencing rather than what I would encourage a student to do is that if you're going to talk about any meditation that's different than talking about your attainments the jhanas aren't just meditation that's not what the jhanas are this is a big misunderstanding that you might have been exposed to attaining the jhanas are preliminary stages or phases that the mind experiences before it moves into the first stage of enlightenment in these preliminary phases the qualities that you're experiencing are at all times of your day it's not just during meditation so meditation and the jhanas are not synonymous with each other Meditation is a tool or technique. It's an active training of the mind in order to eradicate certain unwholesome qualities from the mind and cultivate certain wholesome qualities. The jhanas are phases that the mind goes through as it's experiencing heightened qualities. And these are induced through practicing the entire Eightfold Path, not just meditation itself. And the qualities that you're experiencing in the jhanas are not just in meditation, it's at all times of your day. If your mind is in one of the jhanas, you'll be experiencing those qualities at all times. So that's what would be unwise to talk about is the phases that you think that you're in or the stages of enlightenment that you may think that you're in or if you're talking about meditation, talk about that in a way that you're soliciting input from others to be able to help you in your meditation versus just boasting about what you experience in meditation. And this is what will help you ensure that there's not ego there. Because when your ego comes out, people reject that. People look down on that. People will push you aside. One of the things that the Buddha is doing, in addition to helping you purify your mind and get to enlightenment so your mind can be peaceful and joyful, is he's teaching you how to navigate the world with so many unenlightened beings. Because if you're boastful and arrogant and prideful around an unenlightened being, an unenlightened being, they're probably going to feel painful feelings to a certain degree. 
and because of their aversion, they're going to push you aside. They're going to think that you're the one who's causing them to feel below you. And now they're going to push you aside because of their aversion and you'll see people will reject you. So in addition to purifying your mind and getting to the peace and joy, the Buddha is teaching you how to navigate this world of unenlightened beings. If you were around an enlightened being and you were arrogant or egotistical, they're not going to look down on you. They're not going to judge you. They're not going to push you aside. They're not going to do any of those kinds of things. But there's so many unenlightened beings in the world. When you start being egotistical and arrogant or prideful around other people, boastful, they will push you aside. And what you're looking to do is create harmonious relationships with everybody around you. By the time you get to enlightenment, there's nobody that you couldn't be friends with, that you would be loving and kind and warm and gentle to everyone. You'll be polite, kind, friendly, respectful to everyone in the world. Right now, you probably find that to be a challenge and find it to be difficult. But as you train your mind more and more, you'll be able to see that you'll be able to accomplish that. So the Buddha is teaching you how to navigate this world and get to a point where you can live harmonious with all beings. But as long as you have ego or arrogance in there, you wouldn't be able to. But talking about, excuse me, talking about meditation and what other people do for meditation versus what you do as a way of learning, this can be very helpful. And the Buddha actually encouraged this amongst his community, that when he taught the teachings, he would encourage his students to actually discuss the teachings because it brings them to the forefront of your mind so that then as you're discussing them with others, you're having to articulate them in a way that you guys can both discuss. And this brings up the wisdom to the forefront of your mind so that then you can actually practice it in daily life. Whereas if you never discussed the teachings at all, then it wouldn't help you because they would just kind of be buried inside the mind. So discussing the teachings is wonderful, but discussing your attainments and what you think you've attained is really unwise. And in addition to what I've already shared about why it's unwise, self-declaring that you've attained anything at all is fraught with errors because all the way up until you get to enlightenment, there's going to most likely be some ego in your mind and your mind looking at itself is going to think that you're more enlightened than you really are. So any kind of self-declaration of where you think you are in in terms of enlightenment, it's fraught with errors because you're looking through this ego and this ego wants you to believe that you're more enlightened than you really are. And as long as your ego keeps doing that, the ego can stick around, right? As long as the ego can convince you that you're more enlightened than you really are, now the ego can stick around for longer. It's kind of like a bad tenant who moves into your house, never gives you any money for rent. And every time you show up to ask for money, it kind of figures out a way to stay around longer. Like you maybe show up to try to ask the tenant to leave that they haven't paid rent. And now when you ask your tenant to leave, they figure out a way to finagle so that they can stay one more week or two more weeks or three more weeks. And this tenant keeps trying to figure out a way to convince you for it to stick around. The ego is the same way. It's going to keep trying to figure out a way to stick around for longer and longer. It's going to keep trying to convince you that you're more enlightened than you really are. Because if it can convince you that you're more enlightened than you really are, the ego gets to stick around for longer. But wherever you see any kind of pride or boastfulness or, or any kind of thing like that, conceited views, arrogance, you need to eliminate that from the mind. That's where it comes back to the eightfold path, where with your mindfulness or awareness of mind, you then apply right effort to cut it off and let it go. Don't allow that arrogance and pride and conceit to rise up in the mind. Does that help you? Okay. Yep. Thumbs Thank up. you, David. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Any other questions on this one? Okay. I don't see any other questions anywhere. Let me check Facebook. All right. All right. So let's go to the next one, which is chapter 12. This goes right along with what we were just talking about. Would someone like to read this one? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Would you like to get the next one, Rachel? If you would like to get a mic, you're welcome to. Yeah.
do not be judgmental regarding people. Mm-hmm. Sorry. The perfectory enlightenment once said to the Bernabal Ananda, by reason of the female household practitioner, Miguel, sorry, Migas, Migasala, a state this disagreement to the uh, fortunate one that her further Purana was celebrated, living apart, abstaining from sexual intercourse, but her um, paternal uncle um, Isidata was not celebrated, not abstaining from sexual intercourse, but lived a contented married life. When they died, the fortunate one also declared they attained to the state of a once returner and they have been reborn and to see the group of heavenly beings. Judgmental people compare them, saying this one has just the same qualities as the other, so why is one worse and one better? This will be for their lasting harm and suffering. In this case, the person who is sweet-natured and has listened, learned, comprehended um, theoretically, and found temporarily freedom is better and fine. Go out on you. <laughs> so much impermanence in the world. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, where? In this case, is a person who is sweet natured and has written around, comprehended theoretically, and found temporary freedom is better and finer than the other person. Why is that? Because teachings and stream carries him along. But who can know uh, this defense expector Tsugata? Mm-hmm. Therefore, Ananda, do not do not be judgment regarding people. Do not pass judgment on people. Those who pass judgment on people harm themselves. I alone, or one like me, may pass judgment on people. Okay. Thank you so much, Junko. Okay, so here, what the Buddha is talking about is judging other people, looking down on people. And uh, this would be unwise to try to measure and compare people uh, because this is the conceit, this is the arrogance, this is the ego. As long as your mind's doing that, it's not going to experience enlightenment because you're looking at yourself as either above people or below people. And this is detrimental to your mind. So here what this being talked about is at the beginning, there's this person who comes to the Buddha and is talking to the Buddha and talking to other people about their father who was celibate, meaning not having sexual intercourse. And then her parental uncle, meaning her father's brother, who uh, was um, having sex and having sex with uh, his wife. And the Buddha is saying both of these people actually attain to the same stage of enlightenment, which is the second stage of enlightenment. Because in the second stage of enlightenment, you can actually still have sexual intercourse in that stage of enlightenment. Uh, your life will be quite peaceful. Your mind's still going to experience some agitation, some annoyance, some discontentedness. It's not going to be enlightened, but you're experiencing quite a wonderful life in that second stage of enlightenment while you're in this life. Uh, And then some people will continue on and go farther and actually get to enlightenment in this life. But here, the Buddha is saying both of these people attain the first, the, the same stage of enlightenment, the second stage of enlightenment. But there's other people that were judging them and measuring them and comparing and saying that one person was better than the other. And the Buddha was saying, hey, this is really unwise, right? He was talking to his student, Ananda. Ananda is 
one of his uh, closest students. This was like his cousin or his brother-in-law who was with him pretty much his entire teaching career. The Buddha got to enlightenment at the age of 35 and he died at the age of 80 and he had various students who were learning with him and Ananda was one of the ones who was very close and studied with him very closely. And he was talking to Ananda saying, hey, don't be judgmental regarding people. Don't look at people and try to determine what stage of enlightenment they're in or what they've attained essentially is what he was describing. He says he is the one who's able to do that as a Buddha. That's what he says here when he says, I alone or one like me may pass judgment. What he's talking about here in terms of judgment is he's saying him or someone like him, meaning a Buddha, would be able to know what stage of enlightenment somebody else is going to have attained, right? So a Buddha, they don't have ego, they don't have arrogance, they're going to be helping their students get to enlightenment and understanding where their students are in their journey so that they can help them further to actually get to enlightenment. But a student judging another student and trying to determine what stage of enlightenment they're in, this would be very unwise. But for a Tathagata, a Tathagata is a Buddha. A Tathagata means the one who's discovered the truth or one who shares the truth. So he would refer to himself in this way. So he's saying, it's me or one like me that is able to determine what stage of enlightenment somebody else is in. And he's doing that for a specific reason in order to help them to be able to continue to grow and develop. But one student trying to measure and compare another student there's no benefit in that. It's actually harmful to the mind. So he's teaching people not to be judgmental towards others, because as soon as you're judgmental towards others, you're going to also be judgmental toward yourself and you might be negative and degrading to yourself. So if you have like negative self-talk in your mind where you're diminishing yourself, look at your mind. You probably will notice that you judge other people too. When you walk down the street or when you see things on the news or you hear from your family, you might be trying to judge them as being good or bad or right or wrong and putting yourself above or below them because your mind having negative self-talk, you're judging yourself. You're looking down on yourself. So you'll tend to do the same thing with other people too. So if you clean up your life practice by training your mind, the Buddha provides various tools and techniques to be able to do that where you're no longer judging others. You'll notice that you'll no longer judge yourself either, that you'll have this positive and healthy relationship with yourself rather than having this negative and diminishing relationship. So here the Buddha is helping you to understand that a bit. Any questions here? Remember, for those of you guys on Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, you can put that in the comments section or in Zoom, you can raise your hand electronically and ask any questions that you like. Any questions on this topic? Okay, so let's go to the next one. As you can see here, each one of these chapters, they have the original words of the Buddha here. And then you've got a reference here that takes you back to the original source teachings in the Pali Canon. The original source teachings of the Buddha are assembled in 45 large books that are about this thick. And these books contain the largest collection we have of the teachings of the Buddha. So this reference will take you back to that. And then in addition to that, you've got reflections from me to be able to help you to understand how to implement this into your life. So here I'm describing, you know, what is judgment? And that judgment is something that you need to eliminate from the mind where you're looking down on other people. But then I'm also describing discernment here. What discernment is, is discernment is wise decision making. You need that in order to get to enlightenment. That's the difference between judgment and discernment. That judging someone is looking at somebody else and trying to determine what's right or wrong for them or what is wholesome and unwholesome for them. That's judgment. That's putting yourself above or below someone. That won't allow you to get to enlightenment. As long as your mind's doing that, you'll be hindered from getting to enlightenment. But what discernment is, this is wise decision making where based on your wisdom, you're looking out at the world and trying to decide what you should do for yourself, right? And what's good for your life. That's discernment. That's wise decision making. And that's what you actually need in order to get to enlightenment. So sometimes people confuse judgment. They think just making a decision is a judgment, but judgment and discernment are two different things. Judgment is looking down on people or putting yourself below people. And discernment is wise decision making. One of them you need to eradicate and one of them you need to cultivate in order to get to enlightenment. Discernment is what you would like to cultivate in order to get to enlightenment. So you've got all these different uh, reflections for me to be able to help you move this into your practice. Okay, this is chapter 13. Is there someone who would like to read this? Yes. Oh, that's right. You already volunteered. 
Five great thieves. Monks, there are these five great thieves to be found in the world. What are the five? Monks, here a certain one of the great thieves thought, to be sure, will I, surrounded by a hundred or by a thousand, wander about among villages, towns, and the possessions of kings, slaying and causing to be slain, destroying and causing destruction, tormenting and causing torment. He, in the course of time, surrounded by a hundred or by a thousand, wanders about among villages, towns, and the possessions of kings, slaying and causing to be slain, destroying and causing destruction, tormenting and causing torment. Now indeed, monks, a certain unwholesome monk thought, to be sure, I, surrounded by a hundred or by a thousand, will make an alms tour among villages, towns in the possessions of kings, honored, respected, appreciated, worshipped, admired, supported by householders, by those who have gone forth into homelessness, and by the requisite of robes, alms food, bedding, and medicine. He, in the course of time, surrounded by a hundred, by a thousand, made an alms tour among villages, towns in the possessions of kings, honored, respected, appreciated, worshipped, admired, supported by householders and receiving the requisite of robes, alms food, bedding, and medicine for those who go forth into homelessness. This monks is the first great thief found existing in the world. Again, monks, here a certain unwholesome monk, having mastered thoroughly teachings and the discipline made known by the Tathagata, takes it for his own. This monks is a second great thief found existing in the world. Again, monks, here a certain unwholesome monk blames a follower of the pure Brahma life, one leading the absolutely pure Brahma life, for an unfounded breach of the Brahma life. This monks is the third great thief found existing in the world. Again, monks, a certain unwholesome monk favors and persuades a householder on account of those things which are important possessions of the community, on account of those things which are its important requisites, that is to say, a park, a site for a park, a vihara, monastery, a site for a vihara, a couch, a chair, a bolster, a pillow, a brass vessel, a brass jar, a brass pot, a brass receptacle, a brass razor, an axe, a hatchet, a hoe, a spade, a creeper, bamboo, manja grass, babaja grass, tina grass, clay, wooden articles, earthware articles. This monks is a fourth great thief found existing in the world. Monks in the world with the heavenly beings and including Mara, including the Brahma world, including aesthetics and Brahmins, including breathing things, including heavenly beings and men, this is the chief great thief. He who claims a non-existent state of further men, enlightenment, which has not been attained. What is the reason for this? Monks, you have eaten the country's alms food by theft. Okay, thank you so much, Rachel. So there's five different things that the Buddha is describing here. I'm going to kind of focus in on maybe two or three of them, helping you guys to understand. But you can ask any questions that you like about any of these. So here, number two, what the Buddha is describing here is a thief, is someone who basically has learned his teachings and then take them for themselves and think that they are now hit their teachings and then they go out and they claim that these are their teachings, right? So if somebody takes the Buddhist teachings, tries to learn those, and then goes out and claims that they are their teachings, that they don't give credit to the Buddha as these are the actual Buddhist teachings. So the Buddha is describing this as a thief, right? You can look at this in terms of the Buddhist teachings, but you can also look at this in terms of your life too. Like if you went out and plagiarized, right? If you were in school and you took somebody else's research and then you published it as your own, this would be plagiarized plagiarism, right? And you would be able to potentially get into a lot of trouble experiencing this kind of thing. You would 
uh, have all kinds of detrimental situations occurring where you're now stealing somebody else's work and claiming that it's your own. And that's what the Buddha is talking about here and describing this person as a thief, right? It's wise that if you're going to use somebody else's work that you reference that work and even ask permission perhaps. With the teachings of the Buddha, I don't look at them as belonging to any one particular person. They don't belong to the Buddha, so to speak, but it's unwise to take something like the teachings of the Buddha and then claim that they're actually your teachings. So the Buddha is uh, saying here that this person is a thief because they've stolen something that doesn't belong to them and now they're claiming that it's their own. But in terms of using the teachings, learning from the teachings, sharing the teachings with other people, wonderful, you know, that that's outstanding, but it's the claiming of these are my teachings and not the Buddha's, that's where the Buddha's describing this person as a thief. This next one that he's talking about here is, he's talking about someone who is looking at a Brahmin and saying that this person has done something wrong and that they're unwise and that they've somehow uh, broken uh, their practice. What a Brahmin is, is is a Hindu priest. This is what we would probably consider a Hindu priest. During the lifetime of the Buddha, there were many Brahmin who were practicing certain rites and rituals and ceremonies. They were also practicing a certain amount of moral conduct. So if somebody were to judge a Brahmin and say, ah, look at that Brahmin, that Brahmin's doing this and doing that wrong, you know, they're so bad. This is judgment. That's why this is here, that this is the Buddha describing someone who's judging a person who's trying to practice the holy life and that person's judging the buddha saying okay this person's a thief that that they're trying to essentially steal attention from this person essentially what this is describing is this is describing someone who's slandering or gossiping another person and if you're slandering or gossiping somebody it doesn't matter who it is it's very unwise typically the reason why the mind will do that is because the mind wants to be glorified itself it wants to look so great in front of other people so the unenlightened mind thinks that if i can diminish other people and i can slander other people and i can gossip other people it'll make me look better but this is really untrue that when you gossip other people, when you slander other people, it makes you look really bad. What the unrelated mind thinks is that if I can put out somebody else's candle, it'll make my candle shine brighter. But this isn't actually true. If you have two candles in the room, it makes the room brighter. So putting out somebody else's candle doesn't actually help you. And this comes from one's mind's own ego. If you have ego and arrogance and you want to look so wonderful in front of others, you might think that it's wise to put out the candle of somebody else when it's not wise to do so. So the Buddha is teaching you not to actually do that. And then this fourth one down here, or I'm sorry, the fifth one here, the Buddha is describing how it would be unwise to share with other people what your attainments are. And this is what we were talking about earlier, that if you were to claim to people that you're enlightened, this is also a uh, coming from the arrogance, the ego, the pride. And the Buddha is saying that this person is a thief as well. And then finally, what he says is you have eaten the country's alms food by theft. Meaning that if you're ordained, remember this particular book is, a, is for the ordained practitioners, that if you're ordained, you're going out into the community accepting donations from people, mainly food, clothing, water, shelter, medical care. Uh, nowadays, there's a bit of financial support that is provided for ordained practitioners from the community. If you're accepting those donations and now you're going out into the world and claiming things like that you're enlightened or you're stealing his teachings or you're doing any of these other things, the Buddha is saying, hey, you're eating this food, or you're stealing it because uh, you're not actually practicing to be humble and down to earth, cultivating your mind, acquiring wisdom, and then share that wisdom with others. You're out there being boastful and arrogant about yourself rather than sharing the teachings that are actually going to be helpful to other people for them to get to enlightenment. So he's describing that if you're ordained and you're accepting food like this and you're out there being boastful and arrogant, you're just a thief, essentially, is what he's saying. So this is the Buddha drawing this analogy and this comparison to help people realize that it's unwise to do these kinds of things. Whether somebody chooses to do these kinds of things or not, it's up to them. But here's the Buddha is giving you the guidance to help you understand what's wise and unwise. And then what you choose to do is totally up to you. So any questions on this one here? Okay, no questions. All right. So let's go to the next one. Let's see what the next one is here. As you can see, there's a lot there for you guys to learn. Okay. 
This one is about uh, right livelihood and helping you understand how to get to a right livelihood. That In my foundational classes, I talk about um, right livelihood as part of the Eightfold Path. And I say, okay, this is the first fold of purification when you're learning in the foundational classes. And then I say, okay, if you're interested in learning the deeper teachings that the Buddha has on right livelihood, see volume 12, chapter 14. This is volume 12, chapter 14, which he's going to share with you all of his teachings on how to get to a livelihood that you feel motivated and encouraged and enthused. What a livelihood is, is this is how you choose to sustain your life in the world, how you're uh, choosing to make an income and support yourself. And he's going to teach you how to make sure you can get to a point where you thoroughly enjoy the work that you're doing on a day to day basis, where it doesn't feel like a drag to go to work every single day. So is there someone who would like to read this chapter and then I'll teach it afterwards? Sure, Koshi, go ahead. A noble disciple abandons wrong livelihood. Terran monks, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong livelihood as wrong livelihood and right livelihood as right livelihood. This is one's right view. And what monks is wrong livelihood? Scheming, flattery, hinting, belittling, pursuing gain with gain. This is wrong livelihood. And what monks is right livelihood? Right livelihood, I say, is twofold. There is right livelihood that is affected by taints, fetters, taking part in merit, ripening in the material gain, and there is right livelihood that is noble, taintless, world transcending, a factor of the path. And what monks is right livelihood that is affected by taints, taking part in merit, ripening in the material gain? Here monks, a noble disciple, abandons wrong livelihood and gains his living by right livelihood. This is right livelihood that is affected by taints, taking part in merit, ripening in the material gain. And what monks is right livelihood that is noble, taintless, world transcending, a factor of the path? The desisting from wrong livelihood, the abstaining, refra refraining, withholding from it in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path. This is right livelihood that is noble, taintless, world transcending, a factor of the path. One makes an effort to abandon wrong livelihood and to enter upon right livelihood. This is one's right effort. Mindfully one abandons wrong livelihood. Mindfully one enters upon and resides in right livelihood. This is one's right mindfulness. Thus, there are, thus, these three states run and circle around right livelihood. That is, right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. There in monks, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? In one of right view, right intention comes into being. In one of right intention, right speech comes into being. In one of right speech, right action comes into being. In one of right action, right livelihood comes into being. In one of right livelihood, right effort comes into being. In one of right effort, right mindfulness comes into being. In one of right mindfulness, right concentration comes into being. In one of right concentration, right wisdom comes into being. In one of right wisdom, right liberation comes into being. Thus, monks, the path of the disciple in higher training possesses eight factors, the arahant possesses ten factors. There in monks, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? In one of right view, wrong view is abolished, and the many evil unwholesome states that originate with wrong view as condition are also abolished. And the many wholesome states that originate with right view as condition come to fulfillment by development. 
In one of right intention, wrong intention is abolished, and the many evil unwholesome states that originate with wrong intention as condition are also abolished. And the many wholesome states that originate with right intention as condition come to fulfillment by development. In one of right speech, wrong speech is abolished. In one of right action, wrong action is abolished. In one of right livelihood, wrong livelihood is abolished. In one of right effort, wrong effort is abolished. In one of right mindfulness, wrong mindfulness is abolished. In one of right concentration, wrong concentration is abolished. In one of right wisdom, wrong wisdom is abolished. In one of right liberation, wrong liberation is abolished. And men, in the many evil unwholesome states that originate with the wrong liberation are, as condition, are also abolished. And the many wholesome states that originate with the right liberation as condition comes to fulfillment by development. Thus, monks, there are 20 factors on the side of the wholesome and 20 factors on the side of the unwholesome. This teaching discourse on the great 40 has been set rolling and cannot be stopped by any ascetic or Brahmin or God or Mara or Brahma or any in anyone in the world. Monks, if any ascetic or Brahmin thinks that this teachings discourse on the great 40 should be criticized and rejected, then there are 10 legitimate deductions from his assertions that would provide grounds for finding fault with him here and now. If that worthy one finds fault with right view, then he would honor and praise those ascetics and Brahmins who are of wrong view. If that worthy one finds fault with right intention, then he would honor and praise those ascetics and Brahmins who are of wrong intention. If that worthy one finds fault with right speech, then he would honor and praise those ascetics and Brahmins who are of wrong speech. If that worthy one finds fault with right action, then he would honor and praise those ascetics and Brahmins who are of wrong action. If that worthy one finds fault with right livelihood, then he would honor and praise those ascetics and Brahmins who are of wrong livelihood. If that worthy one finds fault with right effort, then he would honor and praise those ascetics and Brahmins who are of wrong effort. If that worthy one finds fault with right mindfulness, he, then he would honor and praise those ascetics and Brahmins who are of wrong mindfulness. If that worthy one finds fault with right concentration, then he would honor and praise those ascetics and Brahmins who are of wrong concentration. If that worthy one finds fault with right wisdom, then he would honor and praise those ascetics and Brahmins who are of wrong wisdom. If that worthy one finds fault with right liberation, then he would honor and praise those ascetics and Brahmins who are of wrong liberation. If any ascetic or Brahmin thinks that this teachings discourse on the great 40 should be criticized and rejected, then these 10 legitimate deductions from his assertions that would provide grounds for finding fault with him here and now. Monks, even those teachers from Okala, Vasa, and Banna, who held the doctrine of non-casuality, the doctrine of non-action, and the doctrine of not think that this discourse of the teachings on the Great Forty should be criticized and rejected. Why is that? For fear of blame, attack, and evidence that they are incorrect. Okay, thank you, Kushi. So I'm going to describe this first part and then a little bit about the middle as well. So what the Buddha is saying here is he's saying, okay, in order to get to this right livelihood where you're practicing a occupation or you're sustaining your life in a way that feels motivating and encouraging and you have ambition and enthusiasm, that right view comes first. What right view is, is the Four Noble Truths. This is the very first teaching of the Buddha where he describes the problem in the unenlightened mind, the cause of that problem, 
the elimination of it in the path forward. So that's what it helps you to get established on the path to enlightenment. It's called the Four Noble Truths or Right View. Then after you have established Right View, if you're going to then work on your livelihood, the next thing is to ensure that in your livelihood that you're not doing any scheming, flattering, hinting, belittling, pursuing gain with gain. I talk about these in all of our foundational classes. Pursuing gain with gain is like just taking a job for the sake of money, that you don't really care about the product or the service, you're just collecting a paycheck and that's it. That's gonna burn out over time and you're gonna feel very dull and very lethargic and unmotivated in the job. So the Buddha is encouraging you that if you'd like to get this peaceful and joyful life, this peaceful and joyful mind, that you're gonna to need to have a livelihood that you enjoy, that you have enthusiasm and motivation in order to practice this particular livelihood. Whereas if you're just showing up for a paycheck, you're not gonna be very enthused or motivated to do that work. And there's other teachings he talks about with right livelihood too, where he talks about certain livelihoods that can cause harm to others, like selling weapons, living beings, meat, substances that cause heedlessness and poisons. All of these are businesses that would cause harm to other beings. So this is how you purify your livelihood. So he talks about this first fold of getting purification of your livelihood. He's saying, okay, there's this right livelihood that is affected by the taints, meaning the pollutions of your mind, and that it's taking part in merit, meaning that you're able to then practice in such a way where you're, even though you're making money, you're actually sharing as well in order to uh, practice generosity and it ripens in material gain, meaning what you're really interested in is acquiring certain material possessions for yourself. This is like a first fold of purification, that this is typically where people are maybe when they first start out on the path, they might be disgruntled or upset about their job. They don't really, they're not really that enthused about it, but they're just doing it anyway. So if you can get to the first fold of purification, it's not doing the scheming, flattering, hinting, belittling, pursuing gain with gain, and also also, not practicing business and weapons, living beings, meat, substances that cause heedlessness and poisons. If you can get to that level, then you're practicing a livelihood that is a right livelihood, but you still might be making a decision out of the pollutions of your mind to be doing this particular livelihood, and it's not quite yet fully purified. And you might still be kind of acquiring certain material uh, possessions. But then there's the full pur purification of your right livelihood, which the Buddha here is describing as taintless, meaning that you've eliminated the fetters from your mind and whatever choice you're making in your livelihood, it's not based in any kind of pollutions of mind. Let me give you an example to help you understand this. Let's just say as I'm starting out as a young person, maybe I'm 20 years old, I'm 22 years old, I feel like I, I wanna be a police officer and I'm motivated to go be a police officer and I choose to, to go get this job, I, I do this training and I, I become a police officer and now I'm going around arresting people, pulling out my gun, locking people up with handcuffs, maybe I have to throw them up against a wall sometimes and I have to you know beat them up a little bit in order to arrest them or what have you, but now I'm doing this job as a police officer and this is what I choose in my young part of my life. Well, in that particular choice, there could be some conceit or some arrogance that's in there, some ego that I want to be powerful and I want to walk around town with this badge and this gun and show everybody how powerful I am. Not every police officer is thinking that way, but I'm just giving you this in my example, right? That as a young person, this is maybe what I'm choosing to do. Well, now let's just say I get onto the path to enlightenment and I start training my mind and I start becoming more loving and more kind and more gentle. And I realize, you know what? This job as a police officer maybe just isn't working out for me. What's really at the heart of what it is that I would like to do in this world is I would like to help other people. And when I was younger and I had all this arrogance and this pride and I was puffed up and, you know, having this uh, conceit and this ego, I thought it was be a police officer. But instead, what this person might choose to do is they might choose to leave that job and now go be a social worker or a therapist or a counselor or something like this. And they realize that that's what they truly are interested in doing in this world in order to help people. That there was that interest in helping people was at the 
core of motivating you to become a police officer, but because the mind was affected with the pollutions of mind or the taints or the fetters, this individual's conceit was in there, so they chose to be a police officer, and that's what they might have chosen to go do in that particular example. But now as they're starting to eliminate their conceit, they're eliminating the ego, they're stripping all of that away and getting to this taintless right livelihood where you're no longer affected by the fetters. Now, when you strip away the ego and everything else, you realize what's at the core of that is that you really would like to help people and you decide to go be a counselor or a social worker or a therapist or something like this. So this isn't to say that every police officer has ego because surely that's not the tr the truth, right? For some people, being a police officer is their right livelihood and they don't have the fetters affecting it, right? So it's not about, you know, every police officer has ego or every person that does this has ego. That's not what I'm teaching at all. What I'm showing you through this particular example is how the mind can be affected by these pollutions of mind, by something like ego or arrogance. And what you'll need to do is be able to get to the point where you've selected a livelihood, where you feel fully enthused and motivated about, where it doesn't even feel like work anymore. That by the time you fully purify your livelihood, you would do that even if you didn't get paid for it. Of course, you need to get paid in order to sustain your life, but getting money shouldn't be the priority in terms of your livelihood. If mon getting money is the priority in terms of your livelihood, that'll eventually burn out and you won't be motivated and enthused in that work anymore. You won't be motivated to continue to grow your skills and you'll find out you'll get to a point in time in your career where you'll kind of tap out on salary and you feel still won't feel fulfilled with the work that you're doing. So if you look at your life and as you're training your mind, you can eventually get to this point where you're doing some type of work where it's not motivated by the pollutions of mind, where you're just craving money or wealth or power. It's not motivated by your ego. It's based on wise decision making that you truly enjoy providing this product or this service. You may not be there now. That might not be where you're at with your livelihood and that's okay, right? That's part of making your way to enlightenment is that you'll need to implement each one of these factors, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, dialing this in closer and closer. So as you make your way to enlightenment, you'll need to eventually find a particular livelihood that you feel enthused about and that you're motivated and encouraged to, to practice. So here the Buddha is just describing these two folds of purification. This first one, he's describing this individual who's working and who's affected by the pollutions of their mind. They're not yet fully purified their livelihood. They're only at the first fold. And then the second part here, he's describing a livelihood where somebody has purified their mind. They're no longer have these pollutions and now they're fully practicing right livelihood. They fully dialed that into their life because they're now not making a decision that's based in wise decision making rather than just based in the pollutions of the mind. He goes on from here and he talks about some other things which are helpful to understand. Like in order to get to a right livelihood, you're going to need to practice right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. These are so key. That right view is establishing what is causing your discontent feelings. Uh, and then right mindfulness is helping you to have awareness of your mind. And right effort is teaching you to cut off and let go of any unwholesome qualities that are arising and to cultivate certain wholesome qualities. These are things that I talk about in the foundational programs. And I understand some of you guys haven't learned with me in those foundational programs. So this is a little bit beyond what you maybe currently understand. But those of you guys that have learned with me, you understand what it is that I'm describing here. And then the last thing that I'll share with you guys here that you don't see very often, uh, so I'll help you to understand it, is it's called the tenfold path. There's something that you learn when you're first starting out on the journey to enlightenment called the eightfold path. This is what you need in order to get to enlightenment. But then as your mind is actually enlightened, you'll be practicing the tenfold path. The eightfold path is giving you eight individual factors that you dial in closer and closer. The Buddha is giving you tangible teachings of things that you can learn, you can reflect on to independently verify, and you can practice. And as you're doing this, you're purifying the mind, and the mind's moving closer and closer to the peace, calm, serenity, and contentedness with joy. So it's the eightfold path that is going to get you to enlightenment. 
But by the time you get to enlightenment, you will be practicing the tenfold path. There's two extra factors. It's called right wisdom and right liberation. These factors, the Buddha doesn't actually teach you how to actually practice these because it's the eightfold path that is going to provide you the ability to then practice right wisdom and right liberation. What right wisdom and right liberation is, is having right wisdom, meaning you're enlightened, means that you've attained what's called final knowledge, that you've attained all the wisdom that you need in order to get to enlightenment. So everything on the path to enlightenment that you would learn will culminate into right wisdom, where you fully have developed what we refer to as final knowledge, that you fully understand how to get to enlightenment. And then you'll be able to talk about the teachings with ease. By the time you get to enlightenment, you won't be confused about the teachings. You won't be lacking any kind of understanding of the teachings. You will fully learn them intellectually, but then you would have fully implemented them into your life. This is what we call right wisdom, that you fully understand the teachings. And you could describe them with ease. If you were standing at a bus stop and somebody walked up to you and said, hey, what did the Buddha teach about right speech? You'd be able to say, oh, he taught to refrain from lying, slander, harsh speech, and frivolous speech. These are the four factors of right speech. You'd be able to easily explain that because you will have learned it, you would have reflected on it, and you would be practicing it so well that it's just so present in your mind that it's very easy for you to understand it and then describe it to other people. So what right wisdom is, is that you fully understand the path to enlightenment. You fully have transformed your mind away from any kind of ignorance or a knowing of true reality. There's no more confusion or misunderstanding related to the teachings at all. This is what we call right wisdom. Then the 10th factor is called right liberation. What right liberation is, is this is where your mind's fully liberated, that you don't experience any more discontent feelings. There's no anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety, boredom, loneliness, shyness, resentment, jealousy, all the discontent feelings, even the slightest displeasure is eliminated from the mind. This is what we call right liberation, that the mind is now free. It's been liberated from these strong feelings. So it's the eightfold path that leads you to then being able to practice right, li right wisdom and to be able to experience right liberation. You wouldn't be able to practice right wisdom and be experiencing right liberation without first deeply understanding and practicing the Eightfold Path. So that's why students are focused on learning and practicing the Eightfold Path and having done so, it will then lead to your ability to be able to practice right wisdom and experience right liberation. And this is referred to as the Tenfold Path. And it would be an arahant or an enlightened being that is practicing all 10 factors. When you're in the first, second, third stage of enlightenment, you're not yet practicing the tenfold path yet. You haven't yet fully developed right wisdom and you're not yet fully developed with right liberation because your mind's still not enlightened, even in the first, second, and third stage of enlightenment. It's not until you're in the fourth stage of enlightenment as an otter hunt where you're now fully practicing the eightfold path and you fully understand the entire path that your mind has fully acquired right wisdom and now you're experiencing right liberation. So that's what the tenfold path is. And you won't hear about, you won't hear about this very often because it's not something that the Buddha needs to teach you specifically right wisdom or anything specific about right liberation because everything that he taught is leading you to right liberation. It's leading you to this right wisdom, everything that he taught. So you will automatically be able to practice right liberation and you will automatically be experiencing right liberation if you're learning and practicing all the other teachings that the Buddha taught. Okay, so that's what I'll share with you on this. There's definitely a lot more that the Buddha is teaching here. And for someone who is interested in penetrating into this and asking questions, you're welcome to let me know. But I thought what I would do is just teach you up to this point and then just open up to any questions that you guys have on this chapter. So is there anything either here or online that you guys would like to ask about this? Yes, Koshi. Uh, Buddha is saying that uh, it is stepwise that when one has right view then right intention will come and then one has right intention then right speech and so on so does that happen in that order uh are you asking me like do you have to master one before you do the other is that kind of what you're talking about yeah. yes did you yeah. say yes 
Okay. Yeah. So that's not the way that you do it. You don't master one and then move to the other. What the Buddha is saying is that by practicing right view and understanding right view and practicing that, it will then lead you to being able to also practice right intention. And by having right intention, it will lead you to also being able to practice right speech. So all these teachings integrate together and you're dialing these all in at the same time. You wouldn't be able to get to right speech, for example, without right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration because you need those in order to get to right speech. You need your meditation, you need your mindfulness, you need to apply the effort that when you see unwholesome qualities of your speech, you're gonna have to cut that off and let it go. And where you see the wholesome qualities of your speech based on right speech, you're gonna need to cultivate that in the mind. So you're gonna need all those factors to be working at the same time. But what he's saying is all these teachings are integrated together and you wouldn't be able to practice one without practicing the other. If you're practicing one, you're gonna to need to be able to practice all ten, all eight of them in order to get to enlightenment. That's what he's essentially saying. Okay, so we have a question here on YouTube as well. Sorry I didn't see this earlier. Um, there's an individual asking, uh, what is a good practice to not judge people throughout the day? The best way to not judge people is to not judge yourself and to understand that anything that you see anybody doing that is unwholesome, you've also done that same exact thing. Whether it's in this life or some other life, you've done that exact same thing. So why would you judge somebody else for something that you've actually done yourself? And understand that everybody's in a different point in their practice, where if you walk down the street, and let's just say you see somebody who's using drugs or alcohol sitting on the street shooting up with a needle, right? And say you walk by and you see that. Rather than judge that person and look down on them, it's better to have loving kindness and compassion for this person, realizing that they're struggling in their life and realizing that they're having difficulties. And that's the choice that they're making. But just understand that you've done these same exact things, either in this life or some other life. Maybe you're not shooting up with drugs uh, right now, but you potentially did in a previous life. So it would be unwise to judge somebody else for something that they're doing in this life because everybody's at a different point in their journey to enlightenment. And while you might have developed a certain amount of uh, development on your path to enlightenment, other people are at different places. But the thing is, is that the unenlightened mind will tend to want other people to be in the same place as you. So for example, if somebody's choosing to eat vegan, a person who's eating vegan may actually look down on other people who are eating meat and think like, gosh, how, how could you eat that stuff? You bloodthirsty individual. You know, they might think all this negative stuff about somebody who's eating uh, meat. That's very unwise because, okay, maybe you've chosen to eat vegan, but other people haven't, right? And other people are choosing uh, other things in their life. But it's not wise to put yourself above someone just because you're eating vegan, for example, and somebody else isn't. Well, maybe you're using wrong speech, but this person who's eating vegan or who's eating meat, maybe they're practicing right speech, right? So everybody's at a different point in their practice, and there's so many different wholesome qualities that need to be cultivated and so many unwholesome qualities that need to be eliminated. You can't really measure and compare that this person who eats vegan and doesn't use wrong speech or doesn't use right speech is better than this person who eats meat but uses right speech. You can't compare, it's just not possible. So rather than go around and comparing and measuring and comparing, realize that everybody's in their own journey, everybody's at a different place in that journey, and your role in this life isn't to judge other people about where they are in their journey, but instead it's to focus on your own life. And then anytime you see that somebody's struggling in any particular area of their life, just understand that you've met with those same struggles and those same difficulties as well, either in this life or some other life. And this will help you to not judge other people, that you can just focus on your own journey in this life and not focused on what other people are doing. If somebody else asks you advice, if somebody asks you for a suggestion, then you share it with them. But if somebody else hasn't asked you to do that, then there's no uh, you know, requirement for you to go out into the world and share with other people because that would... Uh, be your own arrogance and your own pride going out into the world and trying to force other people to practice these teachings in the way that you are. Because that's what the unenlightened mind will typically want to do, is it craves and it longs for other people to do the same thing that you're doing. That if I don't eat meat, 
everybody shouldn't eat meat. This isn't actually possible, right? Or if I don't cuss and use cuss words, I don't want anybody to do that. Or if I choose to recycle, everybody should choose to recycle. Well, there are certain wholesome and wise decisions that would be wonderful if more and more people chose to make those decisions, but each individual person needs to decide those things for themselves. And if an individual's mind is craving for others to do those things, you'll be angry and upset when other people don't do those things. So just remember, it's your practice, it's your journey, you're cultivating wisdom, you've done all these same unwholesome things that other people have done, and just have loving kindness and compassion for them, understanding that they're struggling in certain aspects of their life, and it would be wise for you to just focus on your own journey and your own development, okay? Let's see if we have any other questions. Oh, you're welcome, pleased to help you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions here, or no questions here. So now it's 10, about 10.45. So what I'm gonna do is stop here, even though there's more chapters that we usually study in a particular day. Um, we usually go up until 11 o'clock, but considering it's Sankran, and they're gonna be throwing water soon, and I'm on a motorbike, and I need to go home, and I've got my son with me, and all these kinds of things, I would like to kind of end class here, if that's okay with you guys, um, by just thanking you for uh, coming to the temple. Thank you for your dedication and diligence to learning and practicing these teachings. Thank those of you guys online that have joined as well. We have a big holiday here in Thailand where water is being thrown around and literally you, you'll get drenched just walking down the street. So usually they don't start throwing water until about 1130 or 12. So if we kind of in class here, I'll be able to kind of pack up and head home and be able to stay dry on the way. And if I get wet, I get wet. No big deal, right? It's just impermanent. But if possible, I like to try to uh, keep my computer uh, not wet and those kinds of things. So tomorrow I have a class uh, that's called the group learning program. This is really good for people who are just starting out. Uh, it, it's a foundational program. It's a seven month program where we walk through uh, piece by piece over seven months, helping students to build up a foundational understanding of the teachings of the Buddha. And I do this uh, tomorrow on Sundays and Wednesdays. It's a seven month program and you can attend here at the temple or you can attend online. On Monday, I'm going to be starting a course. It's called Harmony and Relationships. This is where you're going to be learning about how to create harmony in all your various relationships, whether it's your parents, your siblings, life partner, children, coworkers. We're gonna be covering many different topics related to developing harmony in your relationships. And it starts on Monday morning at 9 a.m. And we go each day until 3 p.m. And we take an hour and a half lunch. You're more than welcome to attend here. And I'm also going to be live streaming it as well. So those of you guys online, you guys can learn as well. Uh, you don't have to sign up, but you can if you'd like, but you could also just show up here at the temple or just show up on the live stream as well. So there's various classes, courses, and retreats that you can learn about. They're all on our website at buddhadailywisdom.com. There's even books, audiobooks, videos, podcasts, the ability to receive personal guidance. Uh, it's wise to start in a foundational program, but oftentimes students come on Saturday as a very first time. You might not have known that on, on Saturday we tend to study more as a study group versus teach you in a more traditional method. If you're really looking to get into the teachings of the Buddha and understand them in detail, I would encourage you to attend on Sunday or Wednesday or take any of our courses or retreats because those are all designed for students to be able to help you develop and grow from there. It's only on Saturday like this that I have this study group for people that have been studying and then they're able to learn uh, beyond the foundational classes. So I'd like to thank all of you guys for your time and effort and energy to learn and grow and to do some meditation to help you in your life. As you have questions and you would like help, just feel free to reach out and I'm here to help you. So have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Sawadikap. Sawadikap.
thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Oh,